Welcome to For Humanity and AI Risk Podcast, episode number 52, One Year of For Humanity. I'm John Sherman. Thank you so much for joining me. Just wow, y'all. It has been one year since we started this podcast. 52 shows in 52 weeks. I sat here 52 weeks ago with zero views and zero subscribers taking a leap of faith that you would find me and that you would care. I'm so glad that you did. Thank you so much for being a part of it. We are just getting started. In these 52 weeks, these For Humanity videos on YouTube have been viewed more than 1.2 million times for almost 25,000 total hours of viewing time. There are also 12,000 downloads on Spotify, Apple, and Amazon. For Humanity is the AI Risk Podcast for the general public, no tech background required. This show is solely about the threat of human extinction from artificial intelligence. Here's how it is, y'all. The big frontier AI labs openly admit their work could easily kill you, me, my kids, your kids, all the kids, all life on Earth. They don't understand how their machines work. They don't understand how to control them. And they spend all their money and all their time making them stronger, not safer. One year later, that is still very much the case. In fact, things are going faster and worse, I think, than I could have hoped for a year ago. I want to do a few things this week. We're going to take a look back at some of the shows uh, and some of the guests that we have enjoyed throughout our first year. But first, I want to share something with you that I think is kind of important. If you already know about AI risk, honestly, you mean less to me than someone who knows nothing about it at all. My mission is to bring AI risk reality to the general public. So I've been trying every way I can think of to make this happen. And a great way is me going on other people's podcasts, podcasts that have no relation to AI at all, and talking about AI risk. I've been trying to do this. Um, So I have an old friend and a client who is a political consultant here in Maryland, and he knows everyone basically in politics in Maryland and nationally. Um, He has a podcast about Maryland state politics, federal politics, and he was kind enough to have me on as a guest to talk about AI risk. Um, There is no video for this podcast. It is just audio, but here is some of it. Welcome to Center Maryland's The Lobby Pod. We have uh, an exceptional a professional and human being with us today and somebody that's been a long time partner of the biggest wins I've had in the game of public affairs. He's one of the best storytellers in America. Uh, he will cut your ads. He will do your social media. He will send the world's best production team uh, to follow your presidential candidate around the country. He's our friend. He's the CEO of Story Farm. Welcome, John Sherman, to the podcast. Oh, man, Damien, thank you so much. Thrilled to be here. Uh, You are too kind in your introduction. Uh, Certainly been a pleasure over the years. Listen, you've presented so much information to a lot of your colleagues in your network uh, recently about something we didn't really expect. You know, we've seen you talk about in the thought leadership context, everything from ad making to production to uh, media of all sorts, but you've really dug into the future of AI. Talk to me about your latest production. I believe it's called Humanity. It's one of the best produced podcasts I've ever seen. But listening to it, you encounter some of the brightest minds in technology, and they have some very daunting warnings. Yeah, man. Yeah. So, you know, I'm just a I was a reporter for 12 years. I was a uh, been an ad marketing guy for you know about the same amount of time after just been living my life here in Baltimore. And in March 2023, I was just reading stuff online and I read an article in Time magazine that sort of made me stop short cold. It was written by a guy named Ellie Ives Ryukowski about how pausing AI is not enough and how basically the default setting of the course we are on as a globe in building artificial intelligence is very, very, very dangerous. And we are in a very grave situation. It is very much under the radar. It is not something the general public is aware of. And so I have spent the last 10, 11 months making a podcast every week. It's called For Humanity, an AI risk podcast on YouTube, Apple, 
Spotify, all the stuff. And it's basically about this moment we are in where um, we are confronting the emergence of artificial intelligence and the grave risks that come with it. And honestly, like if you'd said to me a couple of years ago, I'd be doing this, I'd have said, you're out of your mind. I have, you know, that's crazy. So there's, there's one. Because you really of- went, you really went from being sort of public facing, went from being the consummate professional media man into yeah. getting back to your journalistic roots. I mean, you've won the biggest award, the Peabody Award, the biggest award you can get in journalism. Um, and you're taking that skill set and directing it at this much broader issue that we're all facing in AI and its intersection with actual humanity. Uh, did you feel like that's a, that was a risk or a distraction potentially? How did you make that decision? Like, yeah. I'm going to flip the switch back to the journalist mindset. Yeah, great question. So, you know, we've talked about it over time, but my father was a uh, uh, worked in government for 45 years on nuclear um, non-proliferation, nuclear arms negotiations, all this kind of stuff. So I grew up in a house where we talked about the most serious grave issues at dinner and we weren't afraid of them. And he always had the perspective that like if smart people work on a really hard problem, we have a pretty good chance of solving it. Um, so, you know, I saw this issue. I saw the fact that none of us are aware of it. I saw the fact that I have skills in communication and just felt compelled to do this. And literally like I I put out an hour, hour and a half show every week, once a week um, in my spare time because I am so gravely concerned for our future and feel like there is no time to spare. For humanity, the the amazing thing about this uh, to me is the collision of your journalistic skills and your media experience because just the mere quality of the I say mere quality, just the powerful quality of the podcast, the preparation you take uh, to bring your guests in, the depth of questioning you bring to the table, the lighting, the audio, I think it just the production levels alone, feel like you are smacking your hands together, clapping them as loud as possible and say, pay attention to this. Yeah, Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, as you know, we do things at a certain production quality. So, so the show is consistent with that. Um, But, you know, like, here's a real quick story that I think will sort of like set the table level set for what we're dealing with here. So I had, dinner with a guy who's been a guest on the show. His name is Jeremy Harris. He's the CEO of a very important company called Gladstone AI. Gladstone AI is the company, the private vendor working with the US federal government to understand AI risk, full stop. So they partnered with the State Department and wrote a report called the Gladstone Report. Took a year and a half to make. They flew all over the country talking in meetings with Sam Altman and OpenAI, in meetings with Anthropic in London, like literally flying all over the world with the State Department trying to assess AI risk at these frontier AI labs, okay? I'm at dinner with him and Adams Morgan in a restaurant. And he's, I said, I'm like, you know, how do you, how, where are we really? And he's like, listen, John, if you'd have told me three years ago that we'd be sitting here at dinner tonight, I would have said, no way, AI would have killed us all, literally, before this. And if you said to me, we'll be sitting here for dinner three years from now, I would say, no way, AI will kill us all before that. But I was wrong before, and I could be wrong again. Wow. What's What makes him say that? What makes... A person that has flown all around the world talking with all the top executives and intelligence people about this. What makes him say that we are on a glide, a glide path to human destruction? Yeah. So um, it, it's basically this simple. And, and if your listeners come away with these three key points, this is what I want them to take away. Don't believe me. Right. I'm not a tech guy. I'm a reporter, you know citizen journalist working on this thing, believe the CEOs of the big AI labs when they tell you one, their technology can end all life on earth. They say that literally. Number two, they do not know how to control this technology. And number three, they do not understand how this technology works. 
the CEOs of the companies right. that are constructing AI are publicly telling people, not privately, publicly, publicly telling people this thing's out of control already. And it, this has the and potential it is, to kill a dire us all. threat to kill us all. To kill us all. And so like the CEO of Anthropic, right? Dario Amade, one of the most important people in all of AI, has what's called a P-Doom. P-Doom is a percentage chance you think we're going to have a catastrophic outcome, right? His P-Doom is 10 to 25%. And he goes to work every day in a building with hundreds of people working on a project that they all know has a 10 to 25% chance of killing them, their pets, their kids, their neighbors, and everyone else. So here's my question to you. What are other non-AI podcasts that you like that I can go on and spread this word? Let me know in the comments or email me at forhumanitypodcast at gmail.com. Help me find podcasters who have no clue about AI risk but would be open to the conversation. And let's get me on those shows. All right, so now, Let's take a little bit of a look back at our first year of For Humanity and some of the amazing people that we have met. Show me the world. Show me the happy world where, where we can build something smarter than us and not, and not just immediately die. How can we build something that's smarter than us and not just immediately die? That is the question. It's an asteroid that we are building ourselves. Literally everyone on Earth will die. Oh. A percentage chance doom might be somewhere between 10 and 25 percent are you fucking kidding me dude turn it on check whether it will do a bad thing if it does a bad thing it's too late it's smarter than you how do you sh you can't stop it so the first three shows are still a great sort of three chapter setup to this whole thing please use them as an intro with people that haven't heard of this debate before the first video please look up the second video the alignment problem and the third video the interpretability problem that's a great set of three to just deliver to someone to be like hey this is what is the deal with this but it was in show four that we had our first actual interview the great Roman Yampolsky um, taking a leap of faith, coming on a show with really not a lot of action happening on it and bringing his brilliance. Um, he has become a friend of the show, uh, obviously just a leader in the field, and it was such a thrill to have him on as our first interviewee. The experts don't fully understand. The people making the systems don't understand how they work, what they're capable of. So nobody can fully consent to having this experiment performed on them. Out of 8 billion humans, no one can say, I give my informed consent to have this technology released in my environment and I'm willing to take the consequences because nobody knows what they're agreeing to. Why do you think it's so hard for people to imagine um, AI killing them? They, they just want to know, like, how could it really happen? They just have such a, such a barrier with, like, I'm in my daily life. How could this actually happen? They might be projecting it on other software they have experience with. So how would Microsoft Word kill you? I mean, I can just turn off the computer. I can delete it. I can reformat the drive. Certainly we can unplug it. We can shut down power to it. We can pour water on it. I still think about something that veteran Marine Sean Bradley said in show number nine when he said, you know, if your neighbor's house is going to be bombed and you don't tell them, you're not doing them any favors. In an average week, how many people are you talking to about AI? Like if a new person comes around and you're around a new person, do you like try to get into it with them or are you letting them off? And and a part of my question is like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out for myself, like what is the right amount of evangelizing? And, you know, like it, I don't, if someone is having a day of their own and I'm going to go and take this, you know, the world's biggest pile of shit ever and just put it in their lap. I don't know that I'm necessarily like being kind or friendly to them. However, they need to know this as soon as possible and their feelings don't really matter with the urgency and seriousness of the subject matter. And so, you know, it's, it's a constant tension in my brain. Where are you? In the hierarchy of importance, I place like, if, if I could tell you, if I had advanced knowledge that there was going to be a bomb dropped on the place that I'm like, I can see this place and I'm like, tomorrow there's going to be a bomb dropped there. And I can tell the people there, hey, I know you're not going to like this, but tomorrow your home will be destroyed 
for reasons uh, that nobody knows, but there, a bomb will detonate there tomorrow. It's like, it's not mean for me to wreck their day by telling them the truth about reality. Like, you just updated your understanding of the world. Congratulations. I'm sorry that you're upset right now, but like, it's the pragmatic way to live. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this shit, I, I, I would always rather. That is, that is so well put. That is so well put. Um, I so appreciate it. And it's like, you know, we're not doing our neighbors any favors by not telling them that the bomb is coming tomorrow. Right. Like, Wouldn't you rather have your neighbors and have them had a shit day, but then they still exist the following day? Yeah. One bad day does not equate to permanent destruction of the human race. In show number 11, British artist Stephen Hansen came on uh, talking about the book that he was making. And then, you know, in the course of a year, lo and behold, here it is. There's a link in the uh, description of this show for how to purchase his beautiful uh, coffee table book about AI risk. I do have a, quite an active imagination and... Uh... It leads me off into all kinds of directions and, and it led me all the way back to the pyramids and it led me back to Greek times in particular. Um, and I couldn't help but wonder about the World Wide Web in of itself because it's always been known to me that that was given as a gift to people. But then so was the Trojan horse. And... And I think everything can be built around that. Um, and I think we've, yeah, I think we might be in a trap is what my feeling is. Yeah. All right. So I want to get back to, and I, no, no, no. I want to get, I want to get, I want to get, um, I want to get into what it's like to carry this weight. Like I want to get, when you're in the supermarket line and you're looking at the, person in front of you and they're all upset about their what who's on their phone or what the register is doing or whatever's happening and or you know some things that hit me is like i'll see an ad for like retirement planning or like you know some of this stuff and i'm i'm kind of like you know sure okay um i i don't know how i feel about people investing a ton of their time and effort into like 20 30 40 years from now um, well what yeah, I mean, I mean, you asked me before um, how I live with it, and I think this is why I'm, even now, having said even the smallest amount of things that are really going on in my mind with this stuff, you know, I feel quite nervous about it because the last thing I want to do is to, um, you know, I mean, I've kept it from my family to a large degree because, um, you know, Lisa, my wife, she, you know, she quite rightly she doesn't want it to be a weight that she actually carries and and i suppose her, her point of view probably the same as most people is you're better not knowing uh, and i think there's a lot of truth in that um you know so i think that's part of the problem with this is that you know i always think conspiracy is um a truth that you don't want to hear um you know, it, it, it's it's something that you'd prefer to call a conspiracy rather than actually acknowledge that it could possibly be true. Um, and so going back to like you, I mean, I, I, I went over to Manchester the other day with my daughter. Uh, we spent a full day in Manchester, um, Christmas shopping, went to life drawing. We had a great time. And not once did I think about um, artificial intelligence and and and. But but what's really weird about it is that, you know, because it's so kind of ingrained into me at the moment because I'm, you know, concentrating on writing and trying to get everything down and trying to make sense of it. Um, I mean, it's very much a defense mechanism for me because I found myself in a thing whereby I need to know how I'm getting out of this. And it's taken me, rather than two seconds of seeing a saber-toothed tiger, it's taken me 12, 12 months for, for my mechanism to give me some form of an answer to this thing. Um, but, and with all of that, um, I could still be in Manchester and not think about anything uh, to the point that I even found myself looking around and thinking, 
am I just making this up because the world is so complicated? How can it possibly go sideways? Totally. I have those moments all the time. Then in show number 12, we had a, a, the first debate uh, with a young podcaster named Theo Jaffe. Percent probability of doom. And then if we pause it, that X percent goes down over time. And then once alignment research catches up with capabilities research, we can unpause it, right? So in terms of why do tech companies think that they have a right to make decisions that affect us? I mean, this is much more of like a complicated society question than an AI question. And in general, when developing new technologies, like it's their right to develop the technology because it doesn't necessarily impact everyone. And yeah, there are externalities in AGI development. I think the government needs to focus on more that they haven't yet. But I don't necessarily think that just pausing it would be the right way to do that. No, but I wanna I wanna like hone in on this concept of consent, right? Because it's like, like what job interview would someone have to go through to be given the keys to a machine that can end all life? And what do we know about these people that have the keys to this machine? Well, there is no machine to end all life yet, and it's like I mean, there will be. It, 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 but everybody says it could happen. Right? Everybody says it could happen tonight, tomorrow night, six months, six years. At some unknown point, surprise, it's here. So it's not like think... by saying it's in the future and we don't know when, that gives us safety because it's a surprise, right? Well, not necessarily. You can know when AGI is closer or farther. Like you can update your priors over time. Like I think this happened to a lot of people in the last year. You know, a couple of years ago, it would be silly to suggest that AGI could be developed tomorrow. Now, less silly, but still pretty silly. I mean, Unless you have access to some kind of like privileged information, I don't think there's any reason to believe that OpenAI is sitting on some kind of super intelligent foom entity. And in terms of like the death machine, like could they press a button to bring doom on the world immediately? I think the the hidden premise in that argument is the idea of foom, which we could get into more a bit later. Yeah. But I think that you know foom, as stated by Eliezer Gukowski and some of the original proponents of this idea is quite unlikely given what we okay. know about today's AIs. Okay. But like, even look at it like this, like military personnel, right? Like the guys and the men and women who are in the bunkers with the nuclear weapons that whose job it is, is to get the order and then execute launching nuclear weapons, right? They are researched incredibly well. They are given personality tests, background checks. They are monitored. Their communications are monitored. Like these people who are given the responsibility for millions of lives are not just some dude who used to do tech stuff and is now doing some different tech stuff. They're like highly qualified, considered people on an ongoing basis. And I just don't know like what training Sam Altman has ever had to prepare, like what training has Sam Altman had to prepare him to make judgments that affect whether 8 billion other humans live or die? Well, I think Sam Altman has actually been very steeped in this kind of Miri Yudkowskian doom literature. Like if you look at his blog back from like 2014 before he even started OpenAI, you'll see posts where he's talking about exactly the same kind of stuff that you do. Basically, you know, super intelligent uh, AI is not too far away and it could be incredibly existentially dangerous and we have an obligation to prevent that. And he thought that the best way to do that was by building it safely rather than trying to make sure that it wasn't built or trying to align it before it was built. So, I mean, so do you believe that he has built OpenAI safety? You, you, you believe that Sam Altman to date has built OpenAI safely? To date? Yeah, I haven't really seen any evidence of the contrary that he's released something that would be dangerous today. If anything, well, OpenAI mean, has aired slightly too much to the side of safety with, you know, preventing their language models from saying things that are mean or saying things that are objectionable to certain people. I Right. I mean, I don't even the, see that as safety, but I see like if you look at OpenAI, you had the first departure of the anthropic people. So like they didn't think he was being safe enough. So they left. Then you have Sam's weekend long firing and Ilya, whatever he saw, whatever. Seems sure enough to me that there was something about safety involved in there that got brushed under the carpet. So it seems to me like you can't look at OpenAI and be like they are 
clearly objectively from the outside being the the most safe as far as organizations go in terms of safety i think that openai knows all of these do objections very well and i think that they're proceeding with a very good course of action like i remember in your video that you did on like the three the three ai doomers dario sam yeah, yeah, and yeah. and yana kun and yana you, yep mm -hmm. you talked about how you know sam did things that uh ai doomers never would have wanted him to do you know releasing models that can search the internet releasing models that can code but like you can't know that these things are existentially dangerous in advance like i think it would be a very large logical leap to take to say that something like GPT-2, which could write human-like text that was actually held back from release by OpenAI for months, could be an existential danger just because it could write human text. I think, again, the hidden premise there that you're not stating is the Foom idea. Right. But I mean, you have like, even, I have an interview with Sam Altman. I think it's in that show where he says, like, I don't know if it's GPT-9 that's going to get you. Well, you know, this one's okay, but I don't know what nine's going to do. Like, is it really the premise? The ship has sailed. We've, we're we're doomed. We're all going to die. And it's just a question of what version's going to do it. Like, no. I, Sam Alba does not believe that we're all going to die no matter what. Or else he wouldn't build open AI. Um, like, I think a lot of your objections to, like, why are tech people doing what they're doing is because they think doom is less likely. I, no, I mean, nobody would build a bomb that would destroy the world if you press the button. They think that it's not going to destroy the world, most likely, if you press the button. And, you know, the pressing the button metaphor is very flawed because it's not like, you know, you build something and then just unleash it. There's testing. But, but how do we get to what is an acceptable amount of risk of every living thing on Earth dying? Like, you know, what, um, by what process do we as a global society, have we reached the conclusion that even 5%, 2%, 7%, whatever your small percentage is, is acceptable when we're talking about every living thing on earth dying. I think that kind of calculation is confounded by the fact that you can't actually measure the percent. Nobody has any idea, really. It's mostly entirely just based on vibes. And yeah, in my interviews with Zvi and in my interview with Lerone, we talked about this and they said, you know, it is based on vibes, but it's based on, you know, quantifying the vibes, right? If I think Doom is almost certainly likely, I'll say 99%. If I think Doom is almost certainly impossible, I'd say 1% or less. But also not included in that calculation is a potential upside for AGI. Like if there were a 2% chance that AI would end the world and a 98% chance that it would create utopia, I think most people would press that button. I don't. I don't. I really don't. And, I, and honestly, I think the whole problem is the assumption that they would. And, and that we don't even have to ask them, right? The, the current, the default mindset is that consent's already been given. 2%, the world's in. And that didn't happen. Hmm. Well. In show 14, we met Yup Mindertsma, the founder of Pause AI, the first of many interviews with the folks involved with Pause AI, which I believe is the leading organization on the globe trying to save us from AI doom. Uh, what was the sort of turning point where it got emotional for you? I think the first time I saw auto GPT at work, because I had a bunch of like these coping mechanisms for a couple of years. The first one was, it's going to take a whole lot longer before we get to like human level intelligence. Uh, the second cope was, well, it's not my problem. It's somebody else's problem to, to solve, right? I'm not an AI expert, so I shouldn't be the one yep. working on this. And then the th third level of, of cope was, well, whatever we're going to build, it's probably not going to be agentic. And what AutoGPT showed me is that agent being agentic is something that is quite easily added on top of a model. I'm not saying that AutoGPT plus GPT-4 is dangerous. It has a lot of shortcomings. But it's, to me, really clear that uh, agency isn't this magical thing. There's probably a million types of configurations that would get a language model to perform as if it was an agent. So that was sure. basically the last straw, the last cope for me. And then I felt like, holy shit, I got to do something about this, you know? Sure, sure. And and so uh, you did something about it. You've done something major about it. I'm so thrilled that you did it. Tell me about the process of thinking, oh my God, you know, all this stuff is happening. What can I do? 
And then you put up your hand and say, I can do something. And you form an organization. Tell me about that. Ooh. Um, well, I, I never, I, th I think I don't really thought of it as starting an organization. Uh, so what did happen is I wrote to like the three smartest people that I knew personally, three of my friends. And I basically said to them, hey, AI is going really, really fast. And I'm concerned about this. What are your thoughts, right? I'm trying to like, am I making, an, uh, uh, am I thinking wrong here? And all of them said the same thing. Yes, this is very dangerous. Uh, we should be concerned. But also pretty much every one of them had this reaction to it that they wanted to, you know, ignore the issue and just enjoy life. Like, okay, this could maybe kill us all, but it's not really useful to try to fight against right. it. Uh, <laughs> and, and that also made me realize, okay, this is something that, you know, you kind of, you, you want to ignore in a way, and that's why you can't ignore it because it is, if you all do it, then, then they're really, really fucked, right? We really can't ignore this thing. And then there was, um, then there was a, a bunch of people who I reached out to, and one of them got me in contact with another guy who, uh, wanted to organize a protest. Uh, it was Alex van der Meer and. At, you know, w within a couple of weeks, we had like a Discord server set up and we protested in, in Brussel with six people, like the smallest protest ever. Uh, That's but... amazing. And that was the first, <laughs> you'd think that was the first in-person protest uh, for AI safety? Yeah, in that, in that specific week, I think there were three and we were like in contact with all the other ones across the globe as well. But this was the amazing. first one that had actually like a multiple multiple people at the same time location at the same time. And we were there, there because Sam Altman was supposed to be there at the Microsoft headquarters. And he was like lobbying uh, with the EU uh, mm -hmm. doing this world tour. And so I basically wrote to the European Commission and I said, hey, I'm really concerned about AI uh, and we're going to protest uh, at, you know, in, in Brussels. So can, can I get a meeting to discuss AI risks? And I actually got the meeting. So I was like, this is really high person in the European Commission talking about AI X risk, which was, uh, which was really cool, but it was also a little bit depressing because at the end of the meeting, he basically asked like, okay, what, what do you want me to do with all of this? And I'm basically saying, Hey, try to organize a summit, uh, you know, work towards a treaty, get all of these countries on board. And that's a big ask, right? This is this huge, huge ask. And he was basically feeling like, oh, this is, you know, this is maybe a, a bit too much. And I kind of get that response more often from politicians that what we're asking for is like a lot of weight on your shoulders. And it's, it means also these politicians are just, you know, humans like you and me, they, they, they just, they, they also don't really want to stare this huge issue in the face and, and carry the weight of, you know, working on it all the time. So that, yeah, that was difficult for me. Yeah, that, that, that is something I absolutely want to talk to you about. I have a, a list of questions for you and it's absolutely on it. So let's talk about it. Like convincing politicians about these issues. That's something that you have actually engaged in that I don't think many people on earth have. Um, what is it like to go to a government official, a politician? Do you first have to explain what X risk is and get them to like, is it first education? You educate them and then they get alarmed and then they buy in and then they get to the point where it's like, oh my God, what do I do? You know, walk me through the process of, of talking to a politician about AI X risk. All right. All right. So it's not that hard. It's not that scary. Uh, I really want more people to be, to be doing this because this is like yeah. a cheat code, right? If you care about this issue and you want to do something about it, just send an email to your representatives. It's, it's really not that scary. And so few people are actually doing this. Like, I think I have a success rate of maybe 70%. That means that 70% of the times I reach out, I get a response. And oftentimes I do get like a meeting or a virtual one-on-one. -on -one. And most of the time discussing AI risk is about them wanting to understand the threat better. So they tend to ask a lot of questions. Uh, most politicians are really intelligent and really curious, and they really just want to know things, right? So the, there's a public facing side of a politician there. They have to like present opinions and, you know, be convincing, but in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, they have like this other side. And that is basically, they want to learn. They want to understand. They want to uh, really get to know this, this, this yeah. problem. Um, so I was really positively surprised by like the, the amount that politicians want to understand all of this. Okay. So show number 16, which I somewhat provocatively 
titled AI Risk Denier Down was wild when this dude who was a journalist came on the show and didn't want to talk about anything he'd written. It was a weird, weird show. I, I don't know, man. Look, look I, I'm not, again, I'm not interested in having to like nitpick every single line of my articles. If, if that's what you're looking to do, um, man, maybe this, this isn't a great use of our time. Uh, okay. I mean, I was, so, so you have a website, understandingai.org, right? Mm-hmm. You're a, uh, have a degree in computer science and are a journalist. So I was, I, you know, I went through your articles, uh, with some detail and I pulled out things that I thought were interesting that we could talk about. If you want to, I, I can, um, not directly quote you, but just sort of give you the general thrust of the points that I researched and we could talk about those. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's just like, you're just saying like, aren't you wrong about this? And aren't you wrong about that? And I'm like, no, I'm not wrong about that. I mean, let's, well, no, let's I mean, you, like, you've brought up these ideas in the articles, right? And so mm-hmm. I just want to talk about your ideas. So, so let's talk about, let's talk about the physical world, right? Mm-hmm. Let's talk about physical world. Um, and, and, you know, you say a rogue AI, um, wouldn't be able to control any of our physical resources. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what about the idea of AI systems, you know, hiring humans who are unaware of who is hiring them and why, and they are off doing things and, you know, maybe they're building components of a weapon. Everybody's just building it off on their own and they send it off to some place and it's assembled by another, un, uh, you know, human who thinks they're doing some benign activity, but they're actually not. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, that sounds pretty unlikely. I mean, let's say you, let's say a super intelligent AI develops like a hypersonic missile that's, you know, 10 feet long. Um, could you trick like thousands of people into building pieces of a missile and then trick somebody into like, building the missile and, and to, to, to like take over the world you'd like thousands or millions of these right like well let's say um, it's a bioweapon let's say it's a bioweapon made of you know 150 components mm-hmm. and so you know 150 recipes are made and sent out and people are hired and paid to make their recipe think, and send it I mean, to I, this i think bioweapon is probably the most plausible version of this i mean but the thing about the bioweapon is the bioweapon doesn't really give you control it's you could maybe like I'm not a biologist, so I don't, but it's, it's theoretically possible you could build one that's like powerful enough and it kills everybody. Um, why would they but, want to control uh, us? Like, why wouldn't they just eliminate us? What, what, why do you think they'd want to control us? What's, what's, why would a super intelligence get anything out of controlling us? Well, for one thing, because they, we run the infrastructure that they operate on. I mean, the, you know, if you're at a data center and you kill the person that runs the data center and the power plant that powers the data center and cools the data center, then if you kill all the humans, like a week later, your data shutter shuts down and, and the AI goes around. So um, I think it would have a very strong- But it's a super it. intelligence, right? Like it's an ASI. It's a thousand times smarter than our military. Wait, however many times smarter than us it is. And you don't mm-hmm. think that it could figure out ways to poke the buttons at the power plant? Well, I mean, it's not just poking the buttons at the power plant. Like there's a lot of, um, you know, maybe the, maybe the, the power plant is- powered by coal so you have to run a coal mine um at some point we might have enough robots that it could do all this stuff robotically but um at least in a current if if tomorrow asi came along there's not anywhere near enough robots to run enough of the economy to keep the internet and data centers and um, power plants running and so yeah it'd be really stupid for them to launch a to release a virus that kills every human being because in like a week no matter how smart it is there's just no there's just a certain amount of like physical, um, like manpower you need to keep a system as complicated as the internet and it, or a data center running. So you obviously don't believe in any sort of fast takeoff or anything, right? Because in a, in a fast takeoff scenario, it, it's very easy to, to uh, imagine the system going from, you know, in a day being unable to run everything to in a day or two, it's figured out new technology with new physics to take the place of the pink squishy meat bags that have been running everything and it doesn't need right. us at all that you, right. you don't right that doesn't that doesn't seem uh like a light right, force yeah because there's a minimum again there's a minimum amount of structure you need a minimum amount of um you know you know actuators physical like robotic like people or or voices are robots and even if you assume the ISI very quickly invents a robot like you need to manufacture them and um i think if if some company started manufacturing millions of robots and nobody could figure out who owned it like they would notice so yeah it would take certainly years i think to um in a kind of a worst case scenario where you imagine an asi gets smarter very quickly and immediately starts trying to kill people um i think it would take years for them to build the infrastructure it would take to 
actually carry out a plan like that and um, in a way that would allow them to keep operating after the people were dead. Sure. Um, and so you, but yeah, one of the things you, you believe that AI, um, if it does take over, it would be a multi-decade process and we would have plenty of time to change course during that. And so, so right. I would say the two biggest, um, opponents to that theory would be Eliezer Yudkowsky and Connor Leahy, who are big into saying that we have only one chance, um, against an AGI. And so, mm -hmm. you know, to what Eliezer would, would simply put this question to you, which is, you know, you have your interpretability machine which doesn't exist today, but let's just say it did. And it indicates to you that your AI system wants to kill you. It's smarter than you. What do you do next? Um, I'll not hook it up to any robots. Um, it's already on the uh, open internet. It's, it's okay. like all the AI systems, it's out there. And, and so uh, your interpretability meter said, ding, 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 alarm. It's plotting to kill you. What's next? Uh, um, well, it would depend on the, on the situation. Um, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, it, it, it's, it's hard to talk about a hypothetical. Well, you assume it's smarter sure. than you. So it, 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 it thinks ahead of your net, whatever your next possible hundred moves are to stop it. It's already uh -huh. thought of, right? Can we agree on that? That like, if it, if it is smarter than a human and you know, you think it's plotting to do something and you want to take a move to stop it it knows exactly what you're going to do. Uh, no, I don't think that um, that follows. I mean, like I'm smarter than my cat, but I can't predict the next thing my cat's going to do. Okay. All right. There's some, there's, I think to some degree you could probably do a little bit of cat prediction, but certainly you can't predict everything your cat is going to do. I think if you would, if you were to lay out the, universe of possible options of things your cat could do you could mm. figure out what those are and then you would lay out your next steps to how you would defeat your cat in every next thing it could do and i do think you could defeat your cat i actually I, i'll take your example i, no, I agree. You can predict everything your cat's going to do well um it's not that, a that, thing in german <laughs> right we know <laughs> i mean so those are different claims. Can can I predict the range of possible things well enough that I couldn't control it? Yes, but I'm also bigger than it, and um, I mean that I have a lot of advantages over over a cat. Um, anyway, no, I don't accept the premise that because something's smarter than me. Because another thing is that, like, to predict what somebody has to do, you have to have the information they have, and many people have information. Like, information is not concentrated, and so. Um, I mean, super intelligent AI might have better reasoning ability, but might lack, you know, important information about uh, that's necessary to, to predict. But, like, this happens in, in military conflicts, right? Like, uh, it's a huge advantage if you, like, know what the other side in a military conflict is doing. And being really smart doesn't help if you don't know, you know, what weapons they have or where their troop positions are, things like that. I mean, it, it helps some, but it's, like, not, um, you can't, just being smart doesn't let you perfectly predict what the other side is going to do if you don't have kind of the basic knowledge of um, what their capabilities and, and plans are. Okay, but but the AI system you would conceive would be able to to um, understand any moves that humans could make if it was you know thousands of times smarter than us that it could prepare for those um, and defeat us a thousand times to none, like you know. A, a chess system against a chess master um, that, that you know, we would just have no way of winning if it was that much smarter than us and could predict our next moves. Um, no, I don't agree with that. Um, all right, I, I think this is, uh, I, I think we've, this is enough conversation for me. I mean, it seems seems clear you've had your mind made up. Um, and so. Uh, oh, I do have my mind made, but you have your mind made up too, right? Um. Is there something wrong with having my mind made up? No, but no. Let, let, let's let's wrap up the interview. It's it's been great, great chat, chatting. All right, Tim. Show twenty with my guy Mark Telez out in the desert in Mexico was a wild one. I'm a cowboy. I live on a ranch. I raise animals. I don't have electricity where I live, so I'm not worried about AI. I'm worried about embodied AI. Robots scare the hell out. Right. You don't have a light. You got to have electricity to fire up the, all these computers I you're working on, right? 
I separate okay. my so that, my that, home that, life that. from my professional life. I'm a chief AI architect at three royalties for my my professional career, but when I'm at home, I disconnect from everything. I live with my sheep and my my dogs and my cows. And literally no well, electricity. Well, there's solar. There's I I build things right. So I have a solar. Uh, generate. Well, I have a wind generator. I have solar panel. Okay, so you have lights on. You walk in your house and you can turn on a light. You turn. You have it at uh, night. Yeah, kind of at night. Really really got it. Just... The power is is built up enough that we have lights at night. But we don't have lights during the day. We don't have electricity. Rule. We don't have a refrigerator. We cook with uh, natural gas that's created from a biodome. No refrigerator. You don't. You don't have a refrigerator no. at home. Well, I'm Mexican. Shit, I man, that's that is. It's not uh, common here. That's amazing. I, I'm, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I must be a, a coddled, spoiled American. I'm well, I grew sure. up there. I'm, I know what that sure life is that, like that. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I admire, I admire uh, the choices you've made, and and that's that's really cool. Um, and it's wild that you are so pro tech and also pro low tech. Uh, you know, personally, in some instances, it's an interesting. It's an no, I'm totally got a foot in, pu- um, in posthumanism, and I've got a foot in trying to stay as animal as possible. I don't do anything black and white. Wow. I'll find out about this real quick with nothing. Yeah, you're hedging both sides there pretty hard. I, there's <laughs> percentages, and there's distributions and possibilities. It's nothing is I believe this or I believe that with me. Okay. All right. So let's just go to my base case for why AI scares the hell out of me and why I think there's a extreme risk that we're all going to die okay the, just just the basic sort of like jeffrey hinton case that and uh, let me walk you through how i see it and please stop me anywhere where we diverge right so um ai systems will be given goals from their makers right whether it is whatever it's trying to do whether it's predict the next word make a video whatever it is ai systems will have goals or we agree. Yeah, and I don't think those are the scary systems. I think the scary systems are AIs that create their own goals. When human, when you are in control Absolutely. of the reward function, and we are in control of the data that's used for training, and we're in control of the reward structure, we control the AI. But when the AI starts doing those jobs for us, we lose visibility of control. And but what Hinton would say, I think, is that any AI system with a goal will automatically create sub goals to achieve that original goal and you don't know what those sub goals will be. And if they're not aligned with human values that they could just accidentally kill us all. It seems very, very vague when you, when you use terms like accidentally and here's the thing, the since the very first well, AI is that we're using neural networks, like back in the eighties, like this is not a new thing. We're using the exact same technology from the, from the eighties. It's still neural networks. It's still the best thing that we have to represent like symbols and features and things that are that have are connected to meaning. But in the end, the humans control every step of this process. So there is no getting away from us at the moment. Like I said, if the machine starts rewriting its own code and it starts building its own reward structures, it's probably a problem. And I really enjoyed asking my old boss, news director, Casey Clark, why isn't this stuff on the news? That, like, this is the biggest news story of our time, the absolute most important thing for anybody to be talking about, and it's really just not even in the debate? It's as if we were building the atomic bomb in the 40s, and we knew it was going on, and it was being built all around us, and everybody goes, huh, that'll be a big deal someday. <laughs> and then they ignored it. They're like, I hope somebody's worried about that bomb or they're building over there. I hope yeah. somebody's dealing with it. I can't deal with it. I got to go to the store, but um, I really hope somebody else is going to deal with that. Like that yeah. seems to me like what it is. It's 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 someone else's problem for everyone. Yeah, I mean it's it's the it's the next biggest threat, and and I mean it kind of falls in line with nuclear annihilation begat climate change that is threatening our, our existence. But the thing that is now raced to the front is is the threat posed by artificial general intelligence. And and I do fear that because we as a society aren't choosing to focus on it, uh, it is already starting to manipulate the way that we uh, think about uh, artificial intelligence. And I mean, I, I use the example with people all the time. 
we allow bots to aggregate our content. We are allowing machines to decide for us what we think is interesting news, whether it's the algorithm on YouTube or on Twitter or, you know, even, even, um, you know, I have Apple plus and, and the Apple news app that I subscribe to. Yep. I, I'm still not choosing. They're saying, Oh, well, you've read this stuff in the past, so you're going to like this, but who's to say that that algorithm in the future doesn't say, well, the more you learn about artificial intelligence, the more likely you are to want to shut it down. So we're going to put that way down on the priority list because we don't want it to be shut down. And that could be done by humans or by AI systems themselves, right? It, yep. it, could, it could come from multiple directions. Right. It could be the humans right now, but at some point the, the, the machines could take over and realize that now the humans are a threat and the humans could try to shut us down. And we need to take care of this before they do. In episodes 24 and 26, we met two amazing women, Kat Woods and Holly Elmore, who are fighting the good fight. I think something that's fundamental to all this, right, is everybody needs to understand that the limits of our imagination are not the limits of what is possible. And I think that's really, really hard for people to understand. So, you know, the question I get the most is like, how could AI actually kill me? And the answer is that something that's a thousand times smarter than us, we probably can't even understand or predict in any way how it would kill us. But for the purpose of convincing you, I will go through the exercise of coming up with some things that a human brain could think of that plausibly maybe a super intelligence would do to kill us. So I know you must have thought about it. Do you have two or three top ways that you practically think when you talk to people, you're like, this is how it could actually happen? Yes, I do. And that at one point I was like, I was kind of brainstorming, asking my friends and uh, I even asked chat GPT, um, which I was like, man, I, I was thinking there's no way I asked chat GPT, how would a super intelligent AI kill all humans? And I'm thinking there's no way he's going to answer, right? Because surely they must have some guardrails against saying how they'll do that. No, answer right away. Super easy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, not great. And his answers were pretty good, worryingly so. What what, what yeah. did it say? <laughs> so um, the one I think that is the most practical is, um, <laughs> again, my search history. I'm like, I'm on so many lists now. But anyways, um, uh, so I think the most practical one is there's a whole bunch of things that will kill all like humans, but just don't affect robots at all. So like the biggest thing is just creating um, like super viruses, like super smallpox or super Ebola is my favorite example. Like just imagine like modifying Ebola slightly to make it so that it's like super contagious and it takes like, it's like dormant for like a month or something. So it just keeps uh, getting around everywhere and then just kills everybody. And like robots don't care. They can't get Ebola, right? And the cool thing about it is it's basically just like a thing that automatically spreads from person to person. Like they don't even have to go around. Cause I was thinking like, well, what if you poison the water supplies or something, right? But then you have to poison every single water supply. This just goes around and does it for you. It's really easy. Um, and if you just do that, plus like almost any of the other random things you can do, cause like imagine how well we handled COVID, right? Terribly. And this was a naturally occurring thing that was not purposely spread everywhere, right? Like, it wasn't like there was any, like, agent who was like, ha, 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 I will make sure I'll put it everywhere and make it maximally contagious and maximally lethal. And, like, we handled that atrociously. Imagine something that was, like, really, like, it had, like, 95% mortality rate and, like, like super, super spreading everywhere, right? Um, and then you just combine it with any of the other things. So, like, um, another one is it's just pretty easy to... Um, uh, if you're, like, a super intelligent AI, you can just hack into most of the government systems. Just hack in start World War III with like, throw some nukes between each other, right? Like have like, you know, some nukes from China go to US, some nukes from US go to China. Um, that's pretty easy. That will start World War III. Um, right, just let yeah. us do the work for ourselves. Exactly, and then it can just rule over the ashes. Again, it doesn't care about nuclear winter. It doesn't need sun. They, are they scared? Are they, are they afraid of what they're doing? Or are they just sort of like working? Just like we're, you well, know, we're working on a software thing. Or they, is it like, really, do they under, like, I think the people that were working on the Manhattan Project were probably scared shitless every day coming to work, knowing what they were doing, knowing the gravity of what they were doing. Is that the vibe over there? Or is it just, we're, I, we could be making, not, a, you know, a new app? 
I think um, sometimes you get a sense, and I just get a sense from the ones that I know from like their Twitter posts and stuff that they got like really freaked out that day. Um, Cause you know, they'll say things like, so Rune is this like anonymous uh, web presence that um, works at OpenAI, and and he'll just occasionally post a bunch of like cope about how like nothing matters. And like, it seems like that's kind of how he gets, he today he was freaked out and he's like, this is how he's coping. Um, but at other times, so like in the last year, what I've seen the most from the people that I know at OpenAI is them just kind of become more like generally nihilistic and adopt this attitude of, and this is a small sample, but like a generally adopt this attitude of like, the public doesn't know what they're talking about. The safety people don't know what they're talking about. We are the real experts. It's not that deep. It's not a big deal. Like, you know, like we've got it. In episode 31, we met Leighton, a trucker who knows a whole lot about AI risk and just gives you a lot of faith that like, you know, people are paying attention to this stuff out there. People with their normal jobs to keep up with all of it. And the field is advancing so quickly. Like there's new papers that come out every day. There's new major announcements yep. that come out every week and it's only getting yep. faster. It's impossible for normal people to actually keep track of this stuff if they have a job, if they're trying to like have a full social life and stuff. And that's, one of the things I've actually felt I've been very grateful about trucking is that I get to just start a podcast, start an interview, and listen to it on earbuds while I drive. And I get a lot of time to actually reflect on what's going on and hear from a lot of different experts and stuff. And over time, I realized I just was getting a much clearer picture of what was going on from that exposure yeah. And most of my family members, I'd like send them a video or an interview or something here and there. And they'd be like, OK, I'm like, did you ever watch that? <laughs> like, no, I didn't have time, which is understandable. Yeah. So that's actually I mean, why I kind of. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, it seems so far fetched right to your neighbors. You're like, no, the actual news, the things the, the things you need to hear about what is really a threat to you is on YouTube, not your TV. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, true. Like that's crazy. Like they, I don't, I don't. They, they're probably like, no, what? Like just, I, just right there, we can dismiss it because if it's not, you know, in the New York Times, if it's not on CNN, if it's not on the news, it's what it, where you know, what is this? What, what, what? When it becomes real, real people will start talking about it. Yeah, and it's also like the algorithm, the way the engagement works online. It's so people get in their own little bubble and they don't see any of this stuff unless you like totally. actively start watching it and subscribing to channels and stuff. But yeah, yeah it's, YouTube is the best place to find out about it, that's for sure, that and Twitter. In episodes 35 and 36, we met Jeremy and Edward Harris of Gladstone AI, two of the most important figures in all of AI, in my opinion, and they shared the incredible work they are doing. Um, Sincerity and Sam Altman do not seem to me to be well packaged together, but I don't know the man. I've never met him. Um, look, I have this fly in here that's going nuts. Let's see it's, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's not an opening I fly with uh, on board uh, Edge so device and Tempest. Uh, it's uh, uh, oh, <laughs> well, was. I know. I was good. I didn't know if then I would have a squash fly in my shirt. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, so tell me about Sam Altman uh, and the idea of sincerity, because man, he does not seem sincere to me. But I, like I said, I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll share like I'll share the raw data. Um, uh, let's say much of the raw data that we have, there's some stuff we can't necessarily share, but, um, and then maybe, you know, you can put, put the threads together as you like. So, uh, in person, certainly a very intense guy with a, a very intense stare. Um, you know, you, you don't That's often true. find people with that kind of energy. Um, he is incredibly competent. I think that has to be said. Um, he cares deeply about something. That's my sense of him. He cares deeply about something. Uh, we now get to sit back and wonder what that something is. That something may be the um, founding purpose and mission statement of OpenAI, you know, uh, build AGI safely for the benefit of all humankind. Uh, that might be it. Uh, it might also be, as, as some have argued, uh, you know, power seeking for its own sake. Uh, certainly a lot of the moves that he've, he's made have put him in a position of power. That's also what you'd expect if he was pursuing the OpenAI mission statement too. So these things overlap a lot. Um, when you hear... Yeah. You know, statements made from former OpenAI board members like Helen Toner um, and Tasha McCauley, who came out in The Economist and, you know, said what they said. Essentially, the idea here was uh, this was a guy who made a habit of uh, making misleading statements to 
to the board hiding perhaps facts from the board. Uh, this is something that we've heard echoed from an awful lot of folks in Silicon Valley, um, uh, you know, publicly and privately. So it's a complicated picture, but nobody knows. Mind reading is impossible, and we have to be responsible in the assessments that we render here because this is, you know, an exercise in mind reading is always a dangerous place. I think what you can say is that there have been instances where he's explicitly said one thing and done another. It's kind of crazy. It, is nobody in the building like maybe we shouldn't do this? Yeah, there there are people in the buildings who say that and and who believe that. Um, the other thing I'll highlight is it. it with respect to open AI and Anthropic institutionally believing it, what they believe institutionally is that there is a significant chance that yeah. this is you know, the, the most likely outcome. Not that like, yeah, if we build this, this will definitely happen. It's like, no, we're, we're literally yeah. driving right for a brick wall. Well, that's, that's not exactly correct, yeah. the case. Yeah, but, but still, I mean, you know, you think about it, Anthropic, I think the, the Dario, the founder of Anthropic, the co-founder of Anthropic says, you know, I think there might be a 25% chance that like, oh, it wipes out everything. It's like, well, yeah. It's a very high chance that it wipes out everything. That's, you know, we talk about, we talk about stuff like this in the context, in contexts of, you know, thermonuclear war, like that kind of thing. And, and that's, I mean, that's an activity that of course we've never undertaken because of the consequences, but it's an activity that's under the complete control of nation states um, and under, you know, just an enormous number of yeah. lines and layers of controls. And so what we saw at that time was like, look, you project out this trend far enough. If you're just naive about it, it takes you to that point where you just have more and more and more capabilities. There's no particular reason to think it stops at human. That's kind of just hubris to think that like, oh, we're special or magical. Right. Like, Yeah, no particular reason. So do you eventually get to levels that necessitate government intervention? Yeah. Okay. In episode 41, not too long ago, I got a little bent out of shape about David Brooks and the fucking insanity that he wrote in the New York Times about AI safety. Like I get emails from dads and moms all over the world every week. They hear the experts. They see the threat. But you're the journalist. And not just any journalist. People value David Brooks's words and ideas greatly. You have the rare ability to profoundly influence the public debate. So how can you be so far off from reality? David, your view of AI is a radical fringe view. Polling shows 80% of the public clearly sees the dangers and risks you are so blind to. And yet you make no mention of the basics of AI risk in your piece on why AI is not a risk. Here are the basics of AI risk in four bullets. It is not hard to grasp or to write. One, the Frontier Labs openly admit their technology can end all life on Earth. Two, they openly admit they cannot control their technology. Three, they openly admit they do not understand how their technology works. And four, they spend all their time and money making it stronger, not safer. I so enjoyed my conversation with Aubrey Blackburn, a viewer of the show in episode 43, who asks, what is the good case? Like they keep talking about this good case. Why don't they really actually put some detail behind it? This is madness. Uh, you're a dad. You have a son. You say, yeah, I have a two year old bruise. Wow, um, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's part of the big reason why I just I will never give up. I'll just keep going. Yeah, that's it, man. That's it. Yeah, tell me about that. Tell me about how. So you've been knowing about this since 2014, thinking about it with Bostrom's book. You have a son two years ago. How did how did having a son shift your perspective on this? Well, um, I think it was like interacting with like Chat GPT two years ago or something like that. And, um, you know, it was an early child, uh, just being an early dad. And um, I actually had a massive panic attack, but I was just thinking about job impact at that time. I was like, oh, this is going to poof so many jobs um, overnight. <laughs> well, thank goodness it hasn't so far, but people are being impacted. It's been slower than I thought. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. yeah. I take it like very, very seriously and just... Um, I just wish more people did as well. <laughs> and then, 
unemployment is one thing that we have no real plans for it. The only thing they say is UBI. Yeah. UBI will not be enough. We need a new economic system. And I hear very, very few people being honest about that, unfortunately. When you transition from one economy to another, a lot of people die. That's, that's you know, the industrial revolution when we're testing out theories, you know, communism and stuff like that. Like a lot of people yeah. die because we're testing out these theories. So like, got to look at it very, very seriously. And and this is different from then because our value as people, it's tied to our labor. And if we don't have any value and we are expensive, then I mean, bad things, I imagine, will probably happen. That's why I'm like, we need a plan. Like, what does the good path even look like exactly? In episode 44, we had two of our favorites back, Lee, Ron, and Roman, talking about 50% versus 99.99999% doom. It was the debate I think you never knew you needed. What would be shocking is if I wake up one morning and I'm like, oh, I'm less than 5% P-Doom or I'm greater than 95% P-Doom. That seems crazy to me. I don't know how one would ever get those odds. And so it's very meaningful to say 50% just to indicate that I'm not in that super high or super low range. Then I say 99, whatever number of significant digits. This is a prediction over infinite interval. I'm not talking about next year. So I suspect almost everyone on this PDOOM prediction list is doing it for one year, three years, five years. If you ask me about my one year prediction, I'll give you something very conservative, 10, 10%, two years, maybe 25%. But if you keep going, if you keep adding it up, probabilities over infinite intervals will get you pretty close to one. Uh, people often say, well, that's crazy. You discounting all the possibilities of, you know, asteroids hitting the planet. Let's say one hits. Let's say humanity survives. We have to rebuild civilization, rebuild technology. 500 years later, we're still building AI. In my mind, I think if we slow down capabilities enough and if we speed up safety enough if we have like a manhattan project to properly do safety then i think eventually at some point the lines cross right like if ai was going to take a thousand years and we actually cared about getting our best scientists to work on safety i'm pretty optimistic that the lines might cross maybe it's like a coin flip 50 50 at that point whereas it seems like roman if i'm understanding you correctly i think that you think that the ai safety problem is just fundamentally unsolvable so ai capabilities can just take as long as they want but when they come come along then we're dead is that basically your position well, it's another feature, whatever is actually solvable or not, you you got to try it. I don't think it's actually possible to indefinitely control super intelligent machines. I think it's a very arrogant position to suggest it's possible, not at an instance in time, not for a specific model, but forever, no matter how much self-improvement, no matter how many new discoveries we have, you'll never have one slip, one bug in your system. That's That's an impressive level of Confidence. And then rounding it in to the end here, we met the good folks of Stop AI who are taking a totally different tact than everybody else in this thing. And they are willing to go to jail and put their freedom on the line to stop AI development, something that I think is incredibly admirable. The, the idea here is like, we don't really care about our, uh, our criminal records because if we're going to be dead here pretty soon, or if we hand over control, which will ensure our future extinction here in a few years, I'm like your criminal record doesn't matter. The strategy is to plead what's called the necessity defense, which means what you're doing uh, is just because there is some necessity uh, to your actions. And I mean, we're trying to prevent human extinction and mass job loss and all these things. And, and, th and this necessity defense has worked for um, climate defiance groups in the past with doing similar tactics. Um, so we're hoping it works for us. And then these actions like blocking gates, maybe not blocking roads, but blocking gates will basically become a non arrestable offense and we'll be able to do it till day's end. And that's a, that is an instrumental way that you could achieve a stop is by blocking every single entrance at every AI company. Um, there's a disconnect between the gravity of what we're saying and how we act. Yeah. And it's really hard because it's, it's very hard to act like the fate of all living things is in our hands. Like, what does that even look like? Right, right. I don't know what, what an appropriate appearance you're at, you know, your countenance is if you are really truly bearing that out. But there's been an urgency to this movement so far and you guys are cranking it up like two notches. Um, and so I think that's awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of psychology behind 
how people deal with extreme um, threats. And, um, you know, peaceful civil disobedience may not work, and this may be a futile effort, but, you know, violence isn't going to work, so we at least have to try. Those are just a few of the people that we met here in our first year, and we are going to meet so many more interesting people here in the coming year, um, including when I will be in San Francisco in a little bit more than a month for the AI Safety Summit that is happening there. All right, folks, it is 2024. We don't know how long we have to live, so we live every day like it could be our last, and we end every show with a celebration of life. Got something very special for you today, something very close to my heart um, for this one-year celebration of life. So I have two videos with incredible audio for you back-to-back. The first is me and my daughter playing around on a keyboard. It's a very appropriate song for this show called You're Gonna Live Forever in Me by, you guessed it, a gentleman you've never heard of, I've never heard of, named John Mayer. Um, the first lyric goes a little something like this. Great big bang and dinosaurs, fiery rain and meteors, it all ends eventually. And then after that, I'm gonna play you a song from her senior year recital last year. Great big bang and dinosaurs, fiery rain and meteors, all ends unfortunately. You're gonna live forever in me.
about her? She is pretty incredible, I think. That is my heart. Um, I love her so much. So, you know, a parent's perspective, that is what's missing from the AI safety risk debate. A parent's perspective. Let's change that. We can do it together here in this next year. Thank you so much for your support this past year. We are just getting started here at For Humanity. Okay, my friends, please remember AI risk is not someone else's problem. It is yours and it is mine. Quoting the late, great Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. For Humanity, I'm John Sherman. I will see you right back here next week.